consent of the winner was uh, made by the commission. And yes, we arranged for Kebaki to be sworn in because his term was ending that day. And we were not going to wait for any other day so that there can be a vacuum. There was no procedure for swearing a president then. And the dispute in counting had stretched it to the 30th. Midnight 30th, there would have been no president. So we did our duty. He was sworn that evening. Five, you can call it six because the ceremony stretched past six and that is not rigging. And anybody with doubts, read the Krigler report. I would do the same if it were today. And I not only fought for Kibaki's vote, but for my vote too, because I had voted for him. So I was a willing agent, but I do not, my votes, were valid votes in Kirinyaga, and what he going to announce was what was valid as per the commission. Later, Krigler was to say that both sides exaggerated the ballot until he could not, it was pointless to find out who won. Without dwelling on that uh, unnecessarily for too long, Article 1. When people exercise their power under Article 1, it doesn't mean that there will be bloody sins. If you remember when the Gen Z demonstrated, the first four days were so peaceful. It is the fifth day on 25th of June, which turned bloody and chaotic. But it was deliberate acts of the state, hiring goons, to come and infiltrate the demonstrations, hiring snipers to shoot peaceful demonstrators. We have seen in other countries demonstrators entering parliament. It is their space and it so happens very peacefully. If the snipers were not shooting people dead, entry into parliament would have been not so eventful in the sense of there would have been no destruction. Only parliament, parliamentarians would have scampered the way they did, would have gone away, but everything else would have, I believe, would have been intact. So I do not myself fear demonstrations because ever since my university days, I have learned that demonstrations are always peaceful until police come with brute force. Then there was the question about um, the gender of a representation and the gender rule. I would like to say the gender rule applies either way. If in future there will be more women elected than men, the gender rule will still apply because it says not more than two-thirds of elected people in both, uh, you know, in elective positions or appointed, not more than two thirds should be of one gender. So if women are more than two thirds, it's unconstitutional. If men are more than two thirds, it's unconstitutional. And that's why parliament was declared unconstitutional. I do not think that having women reps is of a representation. Think of it this way, that the world is made of both genders and it's almost 50-50. In Kenya, women are slightly more. It's like 50 point something or 51%. But if you take that it's 50-50, is it really representative when we have a parliament that is wholly made up of men? Without the women rep seats, the number of women in parliament would have been very little. But if we adopt the PR system, we would be able to correct that without overrepresentation. South Africa, just through the actions of only one political party, the ANC, achieved near gender parity. So these are things to consider. Dr. Onyango, 
you have asked how we can get fresh minds elected. Yes, fresh minds, and fresh minds could include good minds that were there before, but uh, the way to do it, when you think of a country, it looks like mission impossible. But for me, I say we will change Kenya a county at a time, a ward at a time. Imagine all of us here on this Twitter space, you come from a certain ward in this country. What if you and others, people of goodwill in that ward, decided that you want to start thinking about the next person you will elect as your MCA, member of, you know, of county assembly? What if everybody did that in their ward? The result would be good representatives in that county. It would mean that we have already gotten um, leaders, credible leaders, leaders of integrity in that county. What if it happened in the whole, in all the 47 counties? It would mean we have transformed Kenya. And when you are thinking of your MCA, think also of your member of parliament, think of all the other seats, including the presidency. It is possible to transform this country if each one of us did something towards it. There was also a question about ODM being both government and opposition. A very untidy situation, and it's the same thing that happened during the Uhuru second term when ODM was a very close friend when the handshake, the two handshake brothers, Raila and uh, Uhuru, became cozy. It meant that the oversight literally died. So it is an untidy situation, and it is up to the parties represented in parliament. Now Kenya doesn't have members of parliament. We are only at the county assemblies. Those who have members in parliament, it is up to them now to fashion themselves as the opposition. But outside of parliament, nothing stops all of us from standing in the gap and being the opposition. Even last time, now Kenya didn't have members of parliament, but we were able to be a loud opposition voice, even in opposition to BBI. So we have to stand in the gap and do what we have to do. Now Kenya has already moved out of, um, given notice to move out of Azimio for the simple reason that instead of taking time to argue with each other, who should head this, who should head that, it is better to withdraw if the partners who have gone into government have not withdrawn willingly, then instead of standing, spending time, it is better, we found ourselves feeling that it is better to come out, concentrate on building ourselves and think of alliances ahead. Unifying the movement, it's a good thing and what can unify the movement more is focus on issues. And I believe where the Gen Z movement has reached, it has been unified, not by leadership, but by issues. We want accountability. We want transparency. We do not want wasteful spending. Issues, issue-based. And I think because we are at a very critical stage, I would suggest that we first unite around issues and values. And then finally, we will be able to even unite in seeking leadership. Henry, taxation on water. I would agree with you that water is life. And therefore, it is the duty of the state to ensure that everybody gets water. But for bottled water for commercial purposes, there has to, there ought to be some form of taxation and you've already 
provided the answer. Tax the plastic, not the water. I would agree with you, and that's something that should be uh, debated and listened to. But our representatives have been acting with impunity. And the courts, to some extent, have aided them. Because one court held that members of parliament were obliged to listen to the people, but they didn't have to act on it. I believe that is a totally wrong decision. If the framers of the constitution did not want the voice of the people to matter, there would be no public participation. We have to make our voices count. And I salute the Gen Z for making the voices of the people count. I also do agree with Henry that uh, um, enabling MSMEs is, um, is one way of creating jobs. Because if one small or medium enterprise has to, two to ten people, even just two to three people, those are very many jobs. It will result in millions of jobs created. I also do agree that we need to have a plan for ourselves as a nation and as Africans. A plan of where we want to go and how to utilize our resources. The West and others and uh, East have a plan for us, a plan on how to exploit our minerals, how to exploit our resources, including carbon credits, for them to sustain their development, not to sustain us. Andrew Maubi asked about uh, Article 37 and Article 1 and asked who is to blame when violence is unleashed on the Gen Z, is it the police or the regime? Quickly, I would say it's both, because yeah. each police officer must act individually within the law. The regime, because of deploying police to do that which is unlawful. And I gave the example of the day of the 25th of June, but also every day that there has been a demonstration, including yesterday, you can see the police using excessive force. There's nothing wrong with demonstrators being in the CBD. They are unarmed. Carrying coffins is not an offense. Blowing whistles is not an offense or carrying your phone. So both the regime and the individual police officers deployed out there and their commanders are to blame and they should be held to account. And I know that people are going to go to court to get those police officers to be held to account. It is up to us collectively to hold the regime to account. Ruto actually validated, he affirmed the police on the day they murdered the young people. He has affirmed them every day and they continue sending them out. Therefore, he has owned the violence that has been visited on Kenyans. The Kenya National Commission on Human Rights says 60 people dead, 60 missing. It means at the end of the day, we may count upwards of 100 or even 200. We don't know how many more bodies are going to be in that quarry or anywhere else. This is something we should take very seriously. When someone's right to life is taken away, we all feel threatened because you don't know when it will be you or somebody close to you. It's a matter we must take very seriously as Kenyans. Maraga's advisory on dissolving parliament because it's unconstitutional. Uhuru failed to do it. That doesn't mean it is right. Ruto has the obligation to do it. And I believe there are people who have gone to court to try and enforce that. My exiting Azimio is not submission. If you understood Azimio, you would then understand more the exiting. You have just seen us acting as principles together. You wouldn't know what goes on or how it is structured. 
but as Mio's Secretary General is Junet Mohammed, ODM. Chairman of the board, Wikif Oparanya, ODM. Party leader, Raila Odinga, ODM. Overall chairman, Uhuru Kenyatta, Jubilee. Now, in that kind of situation when Azimio leadership, top leadership, is ODM heavy, and we have been seeking to restructure and have not managed to restructure since the elections ended, and ODM has a leg in government, I do not think, and the neck of North Kenya does not think that we should take our time trying to reorganize something we have attempted to and have not succeeded in the last two years, we better concentrate, utilize time better, building our party. In any event, since the NADCO report of November last year, we have not participated much in Azimio matters because we rejected NADCO differences over that report and how we conducted the talks emerged and therefore we have not been too much on the inside so we think it is best to be out and to build the party that does not mean that on matters where we agree we would not stand with our opposition brothers and work together with them mock political class yes we belong to the political class. And I have belonged to the political class since I was first elected in 1992. Before then, I was active as a citizen before 30, seeking for multi-party. I can give the milestones that I have participated in bringing at every stage. And I don't think I'm done. And I don't think that the political class can be wholly excluded. We are Kenyans, and we too are entitled to participate in matters that affect us. But the electorate, as voters, you can exclude those you feel need to be excluded. Not being part of the political class does not make everyone suitable under Chapter 6. There are people who are not the political class and who are not suitable. And if you just blanket say it's the political class you are barring, you will end up getting, getting unsuitable people coming into the political class. I think it is best to have a lens that applies chapter six and look at those of us who have been in, if we have been part of the problem, not the solution, get us out. That is the work of a voter to decide whom to give their vote and whom to withdraw to withdraw the vote from. And I would encourage those who would want to know more about me. There is an interview I gave recently, a life story, cleaning the airwaves, CTA. You will find more about me. And my book is also just about to come out, my my biography. Um what else did I want to say? Uh, power vacuum. I don't think there can be a power vacuum. Even if government and parliament were to resign at the same time, meaning that uh, the speaker is not available, the people of Kenya can get a constituency assemb a, a constituent assembly. We have 47 counties, and it is possible to say, let each county br bring so many to form a constituent assembly as a temporary caretaker. And that constituent assembly can also form a summit so that it is possible. And these are just my wild thoughts in the sense that it's not something we have done, just like we have not seen Article, the power in Article 1 exercised. Now, about um, accountability, our, the Auditor General, Nancy Gatongo, in her latest report showed that one trillion, we had lost one trillion through mismanagement, outright theft and corruption. This is just about the amount we need to pay our debts every year. 
it is possible to better manage ourselves and our debt if we were operating above board. And the question about whether we, we have to pay our debt, yes, any money borrowed with the approval of parliament and which has been paid into the consolidated fund, we are liable to pay. That is what is called a sovereign debt. But there are other debts which can be voided. If a regime borrows a debt without the approval of parliament, it happened during Uhuru, it's also happening under Ruto. And that money is spent abroad without reaching the consolidated fund. That is a debt that can be voided. Mozambique and Singapore have been able through the international court and negotiations to avoid certain debt. So yes, it can be, but it takes quite some doing to get there. De Guanjiro, I uh, agree with your comments. Um, the last question I was asked is what next after now Kenya has left? <clears throat> we'll continue building our party, working with all progressive forces, including the Gen Z. But like I said, Gen Z should be led and Kenyans at this stage should concentrate, not who is the leader, but on the values and the issues that we are tackling. And then there was the last question about the 1969 oath. I've actually talked about that oathing in passing because I wasn't, I was, I didn't take oath and I was not, I was in class six. So it's through the eyes of a standard six person. There were two oaths. One oath not to let the, uh, the uh, leadership go to the Lewis. The second oath was by Kiambu people not to let the flag cross the river Chania. So you can see even within the Mount Kenya, there was, you know, people hiding behind an enclosure. I think, I don't believe in or thing, in such odds. That is why I was comfortable to be Raila's running mate. Otherwise, I would have been breaching the oath. And I don't think it's everybody who believes in the oath. Otherwise, Raila would not have gotten the highest number of votes he has ever gotten in Mount Kenya of 800 plus thousand. And I believe he got more if you count the diaspora. So I don't think that in the right thinking people, those oaths carry weight. What carried weight this time in Mount Kenya was propaganda that had been sold for so long. And that's why recently, because Mount Kenya was sort of like under lock and key. We had to bring people together for them to know, yes, they can come out and they can dissent because as though dissent had been killed in that region. I think we have a duty, collective and individual again, in all the spaces we stand to make, uh, to ensure that we all claim our agency as people as communities, and that we stand together on issues. Thank you. Thank you so much.